In 1917, the United States of America would enter the Great War, bringing along a unique weapon largely overlooked in Europe, the shotgun. Hi, I'm Othias, and this, ooh, is a Remington Model 10 pump action shotgun. Now, you'll notice that it has a handguard and a bayonet lug, which makes it a trench gun. Weighing in at eight pounds even with an overall length of 42 inches, this gun's actually a little larger and a little more cumbersome than most people think on first sight. However, still handy. The magazine tube under the barrel takes five 12 gauge cartridges. Now, as we start these shows, I usually discuss a bit about the history of the company that rolled out these guns, or perhaps straight to the designer. Well, in the case of the company, we've already covered Remington. We did a pretty good job when we talked about rolling blocks, so tune on back to that episode if that's what you need. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to assume that you guys know plenty about one of the oldest and most well-known arms makers in the U.S., and we're going to get right into the meat and potatoes. That doesn't mean, however, that we get to go straight into this gun, because there's always context. And we kind of have to talk about a gun who I would rather have done an episode on before this episode, but the resources were here for this, and they were not here for it. And that gun is the, oh, Winchester 1897 commercial shotgun. Uh, the commercial one is the one we care about in this instance, because this is the gun that defined the pump action market. Uh, pump actions for both rifles and shotguns were known before the 97, but this was the first commercially successful one, and boy was it a runaway hit. These things are easily recognized today. I'm sure over half our audience knew exactly what it was while I was pulling it into frame. It's famous. Now, at the time, you have to understand that Remington has to compete with this gun. They have to come out with a product that can take on what is absolutely defining the market. I mean, this is the shotgun version of the Browning Model 1900 pistol. Well, in order to do that, you have to go after the gun's weaknesses. Now, let me get this out of our way. Again, I would have preferred to do our 97 episode because it has much more to do with the development of the trench gun. Opportunity is opportunity. So, if you're watching this two years from now and we've already done both episodes, go watch the 97. But if you're one of our regular followers, sorry guys, uh, we're just going to have to point out a couple things real quick so that we can get to the next part. Let's just take a closer look. Without going into too much detail, I just need to say the big weak point of this gun. So, we have a pump action 12 gauge shotgun, although this was available in a number of cartridges. Uh, the big thing you're going to see is that it has a breech block that has to leave the action. It's external breech block and then it comes sucking back in. At that point it resets the hammer and it is indeed a hammer fire, external hammer. So there's a couple of things that obviously kind of stand out with a gun like this, especially as we start to look at using them, I mean not just in a military sense but in a sporting sense of being out in the mud and muck and looking for ducks. Uh, we have a lot of openings. We have a big ejection port. We have a big loading port. We have a big rear receiver port so that the action can come out of the receiver. We have three areas of potential mud, muck, snow, rainwater, uh, things that cause rust, things that bind the action. And then if you flip her over, we still have some little fiddly bits that are also going to let in little bits of moisture and yada yada. So add in the fact that just by the fact that it's a pump action and we have this action bar, again, stuff can ride along that to get into the gun, although not as likely. There's a lot of ways for a pump action shotgun like the Winchester 97 to slowly get gummed up. And that creates an opportunity for Remington. And by the way, I mean, look, you can just get down and it doesn't even seal up when it's sealed up. There's a lot that you could do here. So all Remington needed to do was to take something like this and button it right up, seal it real good. Eh, the problem is they needed a design, and luckily they would find one from a man that John Moses Browning himself called the world's greatest gun designer. That man is John Douglas Pedersen. Born May of 1881 at Grand Island, Nebraska, little Johnny was the third child of four to Danish immigrant ranchers. 
His upbringing in early years saw him wandering the slightly less Wild West. And that is about where the early biography ends. I wasn't able to scrape any information about his education, although from patent records he was designing firearms from his mid-twenties. This would bring him into contact with Remington, who wisely recognized his potential genius and contracted with him for a number of designs. Just as a bit of preview, these included the Model 51 and 54 pistols, Models 12, 14, and 25 pump-action rifles, the famed Pedersen rifle, which competed with the Garand, and the Pedersen device, which we'll hopefully talk about in our series, if we get lucky. Our gun today, however, would first appear in a patent filed in 1901. Granted, in 1903, this reveals a hammerless pump-action shotgun, using a receiver with only one opening for both loading and ejecting. That means it eliminates two holes from the Winchester 97 design. This was exactly what Remington needed to take on Winchester. And so they bought it out, had mechanical drawings ready by 1905, took a little bit while, a little bit of time to get that factory set up, 1907, 1908. So it becomes the Remington model 1908, which is going to be available everybody next year. Next year comes nothing. I'm not sure why, but there was a delay. So we start to see the gun in 1910, at which point it has changed names to the Remington model number 10. All right, so that goes in that Remington number system. Now later that would get shortened just to Remington 10. That's it, so rather Remington model 10. So 1908, model number 10, model 10, all the same gun, all of them happen to be this gun right here. This is a commercial model a little bit later in production, but that's all right. It'll serve our purposes. Let's take a moment before we get into, you know, the military side of this and look at this commercial shotgun. All right. So as you can see, compared to that Winchester, we are buttoned up. There is nothing to let in any muck, mud, or dirt except this underside port. Patented plastic pokey underside port. So uh, we feed into our magazine from here, and then when we are done and we pump, it's going to bloop, throw them right out the bottom as well. And it's a very controlled feed, by the way, straight down. Now, this creates a situation where you have the least likely instance of introducing enemy agents into your action. Now, while we've got the gun, we can go ahead and take a closer look at some of the features. First of all, they were available in various lengths, so don't count that just yet, but they are pump action with the release here. So when we're buttoned up and we have it fired, poke, pull, and we're clear, you would close her up, you would load your five rounds, and then pump one into the chamber. Uh, these guns were billed as six shots, but it's really five in the tube, one in the chamber, which is kind of misleading because among pump shotguns, this one's one of the harder ones to go ahead and preload. If you don't get your 12 gauge round in there just right, the rim snags very easily on this gun, for me anyway. And unloading is also a little bit of a bother. I'm sure some of you have gotten quite good at it, and I'm sure some of you have these laying around. Now the safety is actually set up a lot like the Garand. It's right, boy I got big hands. It's right there guys, that little sliver. And so, pull it back, safe push it out, fire, that's all you have to do. Now overall the fit and finish is very fine, they're actually a beautiful competitor in the market, and uh, they had a really good takedown system. So if you look, let me flip this guy over, I've got like a little circular nub right there, you see that guy? He's in the path, and doing this on camera is a little tricky, so forgive me while I flip it over, I'm pushing him down so that he will free this key to rotate. Once the key rotates, we can then spin the magazine tube. We can then pull the magazine tube out. So at the base, you'll see that our sort of interrupted screw magazine is now out. That means we can rotate the takedown function. Oops, sorry, let me get that pump all the way forward. We can rotate our takedown function. There we go and we're free. Now that's just a 90 degree turn and pull. So sorry that was so awkward on camera, but all I had to do was get this interrupted screw of the magazine tube out of the way, pump this all the way forward to get this action bar out of the way, and therefore this was free to spin 90 degrees, and you can see interrupted screw, 
and then blank, Ooh, let me get this back into focus, blank side, interrupted screw side, so it's just a 90 degree turn, turn and we're out. Now what this did is allow you to get at the action for cleaning and service a little bit, but mostly it's just that you can sort of compact it for storage and transport and get a nice little case, carry it on the go. Now I'm uh, not going to put this back together on camera. That never goes well. Uh, I'm not sure why my parents didn't smother me as a child because I don't think I ever got anything back together as a child. Now, this gun, uh, because the ejection port is on the bottom and it throws straight down, is pretty handy because it's not going to kick them into the next person in line if you're firing in a line. It's not going to bother anybody except for possibly bopping your tootsies, and it's a good way to hold on to your spent holes in case you had brass that you wanted to keep. So, beautiful controlled ejection. The other part of that, though, is that we have straight down ejection, we have uh, a central safety, central everything. The only thing right-handed about this gun is this first pump release right here. This is an inherently ambidextrous shotgun, which is pretty rare for something in those days as well. So another good marketing point. However, that's not how Remington built the gun. As a matter of fact, they would almost exclusively go after the Winchester 97 by making vague comments about how dangerous other external actions could be to your eye or face and this is an incredibly safe, solid receiver and how it doesn't let in muck and mud. I mean, every piece of their campaign was as much compliment to this as it was criticism of the Winchester 97. They knew whose market slice they wanted. Now, you'll see this particular gun, which is the A configuration, or later named the A configuration. Originally, it was just the standard. Uh, you'll see this and others in the 1911-1912 catalog, all selected by grade. All right, so on our first page, yep, we got that number one standard grade, and that's just bog standard. You can get it in a number of chokes, a number of barrel lengths. Then we have the number two special grade, which had imported walnut stocking and checkering. Ooh. This would later be known as the 10B. The number three trap special grade would later be known as the 10S, and it was specifically designed for trap shooting and a focus on a type group at a long range. It also had a straight wrist. The number three trap grade was known as the 10C later on, specially designed again for trap shooting, checkered imported walnut stocking, and straight wrist. The number four tournament grade would later become the 10D, that's imported walnut, checkered, and scroll engraved. The number five expert grade, which would later be the 10E, was imported walnut stocking, checkered, and with a barrel and receiver finish with scroll work, silver nameplate in the stock. This is getting pretty nice. And it goes one step up with the number six premier grade, or 10F, that's checkering and scroll work with a silver nameplate and engraved game scene panels that are apparently better than the other one. Also in 1923, a target grade would be added, the 10T, with a uh, integrated ventilated rib standard and a longer forend. Now you may have noticed from those earlier pictures that there are some slight differences between those shotguns and this and our trench gun today. Uh, most notably, if you look at that semi-pistol grip on the old photos, here let's take a closer look, this guy will tend to be sort of rounded, hanging down all in the air for people to enjoy. And here it's been flattened off. Uh, this happened sometime around 1916 and somewhere in that same vicinity of time, this trigger guard set screw, it helps tie the action together. This guy uh, had a locking screw applied underneath. He apparently must have been shaking loose at some level and this was just one of those easy fixes. And other than that, these things stayed pretty much unchanged. Now they should have been the kings of the market. Unfortunately, Winchester saw, well, the potential harm of all this and went right for the Model 12. And in hindsight, we know that that little guy dominated the market. So Remington would actually buy up another design, one created by both Pedersen and John Moses Browning, the Remington Model 17. This internal hammer-fired 20-gauge was, again, meant to go up and get a big slice of that pump action market. Just a quick note, the 17 would lead to the Remington 31, Ithaca 37, and the BPS. Now Remington had two designs to go after Winchester's two popular designs, and it looked like there was going to be this big market showdown with a bunch of innovation, and then, over in Europe, they started fighting with each other. You see, that was the beginning of the Great War in Europe, not involving the US yet, and Remington, they didn't even 
launch that Model 17. Instead, it would wait until post-war and be launched in 1921 because the shotgun market just really wasn't worth it. Instead, they were producing military contract arms. So these guys go away and they start working on things like what we've already covered with the Bertier, with the rolling block, with the uh, P-14 and things that we're going to cover sometime like the mosin Nagant. They have large lucrative military contracts and so there really is no interest in going into heavy competition or putting a lot of money or time into competing over a very small, now by comparison, shotgun market. That is, of course, until back in America, war were declared. That's right, baby. USA is going to Europe and we're bringing a lot of guns. Now, as part of that, we were bringing along something that the Europeans weren't all that interested in, a love, a deep resounding love of the military shotgun. Now, at this point, I have to stop though and sneak in one little piece of information because I know you all want me to just go straight into this and I want to too, but I have misled you all because I left one model off of that original 1911 catalog. The number zero riot grade, otherwise known as the 10R, was designed around double-lot buckshot. It was for use in prisons, armed messengers, and watchmen. And I bet the police liked it too. It had a 20-inch cylinder bore barrel. During World War I, the US would order 1,150 Remington Model 10 Riot gun, straight commercial, nothing special, no bayonet lug slings, none of that. And I'm really not going to get into detail about that gun because riot guns are tricky. They're mostly just used for guarding things. And there's some biographical data that they went to France and guarded things in France. But it's hard to prove. It could be a trench gun and it was just referred to as a riot gun. Like there's, there's not really official names for these things as far as soldiers are concerned. It's tricky and they're not frontline weapons. And you guys know this. I mean, I could go back and pull every gun ever made in America practically if I wanted to call them World War One guns because someone in some National Guard unit somewhere had one. So instead, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to probably work up an episode later in which we talk about all the known riot guns at once with the understanding that few, if any, ever made it to Europe. And it'll just kind of whet your appetite and it'll be an easy episode for me. I say easy, nothing's ever easy. And that'll lock it out. Now, uh, by the way, some of the riot guns were martially marked, some were not. It's serial ranges and little things. Some of the trench guns have been converted up and down, yada, yada, yada. We'll see more of that in this episode. Before anybody watching this episode emails me asking, is this a legitimate trench gun? Is this a legitimate, a legitimate trench gun? Um, I don't mind quick identification for you guys where I can kind of toss something out and be like, go, go look in this direction. Um, there's a reason why proper appraisals cost money because it takes reference time. If you send me a pile of pictures of a shotgun, the only way I can confirm that is to take 20 minutes and pull the book and look at it. And 20 minutes doesn't sound like a lot until there's 30 of you, 40 of you, 50 of you, and every time anybody purchases a shotgun, because I get a lot of these kind of emails. And I like you all, and I wish I could help. I actually, if time were an unlimited resource, I would help you all. Instead though, uh, luckily, Bruce Canfield has written a beautiful book that focuses on collecting features of these guns so that you do not get ripped off. The, gun is, the book is not expensive by comparison to the amount of money you would save by getting ripped off even once on one of these guns because trench guns and riot guns are very commonly faked. So go to the description, buy that book. If you have any mind to buy any US military shotgun ever in your life, also it's just a very good book. And that will solve all of our problems at once very cheaply. And also I just like Bruce Canfield. Uh, anyway, bringing it back around, all the riot guns will get stacked into their own episode. And believe me, there's plenty that we could shove in there. Riot guns aside, the U.S. was entering World War I, and they knew very clearly what was happening over there. Uh, I can assure you from 1916-1917 science and media magazines, books written on topic, the U.S. had no illusion about what they were wading into, and so a lot of the general staff was looking for ways 
to either master or outright avoid trench warfare. They wanted to get away from the static lock. Now, in some regards, you could try for uh, different pieces of technology to move across the battlefield, or you could honestly just get way more efficient at staying alive and killing the other guy. And one particular person who had seen what would going on in the Philippines, where the U.S. had actually bought commercial 1897 pump-action shotguns in 12-gauge, well, he knew that the shotgun was an incredibly effective weapon. And that man was John J. Pershing. The general knew that that gun, the Winchester 97, had been an excellent defensive and offensive weapon. It was devastating at specific goals. And when he looked at the trench situation in Europe, he saw many opportunities to exploit its use. And so he would reach for the old familiar and buy up, well, more Winchester 1897s. They would pair it with standard commercial double-aught nine pellet buckshot. These were initially plain paper cased cartridges, but they did not weather well in the field. Moisture caused them to swell, and repeated loading and unloading wore them down much faster than brass ammo. So the army would order that, which was more expensive. However, few would arrive on the front lines before the war's end. Alright, so they have commercial ammo. They already like the Winchester 97. It already comes in a riot size, so that's handy and usable at close range. They can just pretty much buy this stuff off the shelf. The assembly lines are already there. We're ready to go, right? Wrong! Because the U.S. was really in love with the bayonet, as were most people in the Great War. It was considered to be an intrinsic part of trench fighting. Now, uh, this particular one is a Model 1917, or what would have previously been the P-14 bayonet, and it was currently being made by Winchester and Remington at the time, so when they told Winchester that they wanted a shotgun that could take a bayonet, Winchester sat down with Springfield and came up with the mount for the 1917. Now, because the muzzle ring on the 1917 bayonet was in no way big enough to fit around a 12-gauge barrel, and they did not want to design a whole new bayonet and introduce it into the supply chain, they would have to do an offset bayonet mount. Now, uh, this worked out just fine, except, well, once you start pumping some rounds through short barrel shotgun, it's going to start to cook. And even with that forend up there to grasp onto, there's a good chance if you're trying to do some shoot and move, you're going to burn your little finger lease. So uh, they really needed a way to sort of mitigate some or all of that heat. And again, Winchester and Springfield would pair up, and again, they would pop out another patent, this time for a perforated steel heat shield, which was designed to keep your uh, pokey bits from getting all crispy when you handled your shotgun on the go. This worked out just fine for everybody, except of course Remington, because now there was not one but two patents sitting in their way of producing a trench gun for the United States. Now, in order to get around it, they had to come up with their own version of a bayonet log and their own version of a heat shield that did not walk into Winchester's patent. And so, let's take a closer look, because with that in consideration, this is what they came up with, and we are ready for the trench gun. So, closer look, see what we got. Overall, it's the same action. I really, safety, release, nothing to look at, because it's beautifully simple and sleek and lineless. But, oh, if we walk her back, we're going to see that we have a metal clip that's been screwed in on both sides, there and there, that holds onto the rear of the handguard. Now, uh, by the way, in the uh, sake of honesty, this is not original. Uh, we have the original clip, which was on the gun, along with these pilot holes, and these are the original screws. So we knew that this was a legitimate trench gun, not just a U.S.-marked riot gun, which, by the way, I'll show you the markings in a moment. They are not always the same on these early guns. Again, check out Canfield's book for all that detail. Uh... We had to replace this so that we could fit a replacement handguard. Uh, you'll see later in the episode these are almost always gone. And then oh, we have a remanufactured bayonet lug because, again, these were often lost. So we've done our best to recreate what was available. Now, while we're at the bayonet lug, the way they avoided the patent is that the Winchester, as we'll see in a later episode, uh, had gone ahead and milled into the underside of the barrel so that as these screws were set, it had clamping force and it couldn't go back and forth. Well, because they couldn't do exactly that without violating the patent, 
we had Remington go ahead and apply the clamping force without milling the underside of the barrel. And then if we look underneath, there's actually a lock screw here that goes up into a single notch in the underside of the barrel. You can see more of this if you look at Mark's episode on redoing this in anvil. Now, ugh, the wooden handguard, well, that's just the simplest solution because there's no patent outstanding on having wooden handguards. So they could just go ahead and fit it. It's got a spring clip at the front and then the originals would actually walk a little bit under this front band. And then, like I said, at the rear under this piece of spring steel here. And then otherwise, we're looking at a pretty bog standard ugh, Model 10 shotgun. Now the whole assembly, because it is clipped to the front of the takedown, does not interrupt the ability to take down the gun. It comes apart just like the other one I already showed you. And uh, if we're looking at it, we're sealed up from muck and mud. Honestly, a beautiful military design. Uh, again, this safety was good enough for the Garen. So again, pretty military ready. Now these guns ugh, have on most occasions U.S. Marshal markings, hand applied, not machine applied, in, sorry guys, trying to see and point at the same time, this general vicinity here. All right, I know that wasn't the oh, most de ooh, dang, detailed tour de force there, but uh, tell you what, I'll make it up to you right now. We'll just, and then I'll just wiggle, and then we'll make sure that we ruin the ceiling. Ah. How about that, guys? Look at the overall length of this sucker. That really starts to creep up. And that is an intimidating weapon. Now, uh, because I kind of skimped on the details for the gun, because there's not a lot to look at, I mean, externally, this is sealed up real tight. Let's go ahead and kick this over to an animation. Okay, this is going to be a complicated action. So Bruno simplified it to the key points for us to understand. When pumped forward, the action bar drags the breech block up into the top of the receiver, where it locks into place against a recess in the receiver, acting as a bearing surface. Pulling the trigger tips the sear, which is set inside the breech block, and releases the cocking head and its firing pin forward to set off our cartridge. When pumped back, the action bar first cocks the action. As the cocking head travels rearward, it tips a small lever on the left side of the breech block back to the flush position, freeing it to drop at the back and therefore unlock. The safety is the easiest part. It just acts as a trigger block. Again, we simplified this action a lot in the name of production time. It is a very complicated shotgun. Now let's give it over to May. This 
has been my favorite project to date for the show. I love this little darling. Now, uh, some of you are probably wondering why we would, did not demonstrate one particular feature of this gun known as Slam Fire. Uh, what that is, is the ability to load the magazine tube in one the chamber if you want as well, pull the trigger, bang, and then hold the trigger down and keep pumping. And every time you pump forward, you get a fresh bang. Now that means that you can clear a mag real quick, and believe it or not, it's fairly controllable with a little bit of practice. Uh, and yes, this gun can theoretically slam fire. Well, this model, this particular gun cannot. And that is because of its takedown feature, actually. So if we take a closer look, you can see I have a fair bit, hear all that? I have a fair bit of wobble. Uh, and in that wobble, there's a bit of a sear projection on the side of this action bar. And the way it interlocks means it's just a little bit gummy after over a hundred years of presumably hard use. So uh, if I were to, and believe me, I tried, try to slam fire this gun, well, there's between an instant to seven second with some wiggling delay before it actually goes bang again, which is terrifically terrifying and not recommended for range safety. So uh, we will not be slam firing this particular trench gun for this episode. Instead, we will leave that over to the 1897. Now, these guns in the battlefield were devastating. Uh, as a matter of fact, field reports all came back send us more guns, send us more guns, send us more guns. There were only two complaints that really turned up. One, we already talked about in the form of the ammunition getting wet. And two, these guns were terrible on open terrain at long range, which is not what they were designed for at all. And by the way, before I get comments about did they issue slugs or did they do birdshot or... No, it's double hot buckshot all the way through. So uh, you lose some of the versatility of the shotgun because you only have one type of cartridge. That means that these are geared specifically to defending trench lines at close range and attacking trench lines at close range. But let me tell you, they were extremely good at their job. Uh, I know people will play it up that the you take this in and you fire it once and you hit five guys in a widespread like a video game. No, I think from our video we saw kind of what our cone was on this particular gun at range. But the one good thing it did is that it was like getting hit with a burst of 32 ACP pistol cartridges. Just boom, all those buck balls, just bing, 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 just nine rounds of 32 ACP in the air, in a general form. Whoever you hit is taking one hit and down, and then you're on to the next guy. It's rapid, it's easy to acquire your sight picture, you've got an easy hit. This is a good military short range weapon. Uh, so much so that the Germans complained. Through Swiss intermediaries, they would declare, the German government protests against the use of shotguns by the American army and calls attention to the fact that, according to the laws of war, every prisoner found to have in his possession such guns or ammunition belonging thereto forfeits his life. This protest is based upon Article 23E of the Hague Convention, respecting laws and customs of war on land. Now, for your information, Article 23 forbids a number of things in warfare, including in Section E, to employ arms, projections, or materials calculated to cause unnecessary suffering. U.S. Secretary of State Robert Lansing would turn to Brigadier General Samuel T. Ansel, Acting Judge Advocate General. He would write a lengthy and well-reasoned opinion that laid out that the shotgun, as a long-standing weapon of war, had no worse of an effect than, say, shrapnel, and was therefore not any more inhumane. Lansing would take this opinion back to the Germans, along with a final point for them to consider. If the German government should carry out its threat in a single instance, it will be the right and duty of the government of the United States to make such reprisals as will best protect the American forces. And notice is hereby given of the intention of the government of the United States to make such reprisals. 
In simpler terms, that means you plug one of our boys and we'll plug one of yours. And we'll keep going round and round till one of us learns a lesson. Now that's some good old eye for an eye justice. And it seems the Germans blinked because there are no known records of someone being killed for carrying one of these specifically. <sighs> Crisis narrowly averted. Now, the Germans weren't the only ones upset. As a matter of fact, some French magazines uh, noted the American use of the shotgun as barbaric and joked that there would soon be tommyhawks and uh, scalping on the front line. I love that they thought it was tommyhawks. Anyway, the U.S. didn't care. We loved them, and they worked, and apparently they were ticking off the Germans at the end of three and a half years of combat after gas warfare and shelling. Now they're mad about the shotgun. Okay, we're keeping the shotgun. Now, uh, I'm sorry, just have to stop and breathe it in. I know I kind of cheat you guys on the slam fire thing for this particular episode, so we've worked out something else to keep you a little bit entertained. You see... There's a rumor that these guns were used to stop incoming grenades. Now, this is a reproduction that we managed to pick up that is still made out of similar material well enough to test the theory. The challenge here, though, because I know a lot of you are thinking, well, yeah, I could pop that right out of the air. But the challenge is, do we have the ability to either displace it in the air or destroy that pressurized chamber so that whenever she cooks off there's no containment and can we even hit it when we're working with double aunt buckshot not target or bird shot that's a little bit harder to pull something out of the air and it took a little bit more of an arrangement down the range <laughs> You know, I think we all learned something today, and we're edutained. Now, uh, I have to talk about production figures, because this particular gun was only made to the tune of 3,500, making it definitely one of the rarest frontline U.S. anythings in World War I. They are extremely rare, and we are very lucky to find this one, even without that handguard and the front end bayonet lug. As a matter of fact, we were double lucky because the barrel had not been turned back. You see, the reason it's so hard to find them in this configuration, the reason why so few people recognize it even, even though, I mean, come on, how can you forget that this ever existed? It's hilarious. Well, it's because a lot of these would be converted post-war. You see, they were just making extra riot models from the existing trench guns. Now, those riot guns had 20-inch barrels and were never fitted with sling swivels. Instead, only trench guns had them, but these had 23-inch barrels from the factory. Now, our gun must have missed the conversion process because the practice was to remove the handguard, steel clip, and bayonet lug. Then, remove 3 inches from the barrel and install a new bead sight. Our gun had no new bead sight in the original length barrel. It was just missing the bits. Now, if you're asking why you might prefer a riot gun to a trench gun, remember, only 3,500 made. So, it's not worth it to sort of stock replacement parts. And as these guys broke down, I mean, I'm telling you, we did our best to recreate this gun, and this handguard already gave me a little bit of trouble. This is a very easily failed part. It is not a good design. Uh, the gun, you could honestly rip this off and run just fine with the bayonet lug, but... Again, that requires maintenance, and in some cases, I'm sure they thought about trying to work in replacement parts from Winchester and things like that. As a matter of fact, going into like World War II and beyond, you'll see things where Stevens guns have been repaired with Winchester bayonet lugs because they're more common. 
You could do that because they used the same clamping system, but because this did not opt to mill the underside of the barrel and instead uses that vertical screw, you can't make the swap out. You have to have the unique bayonet lug. You have to have the unique handguard. And keeping those in inventory or moving them back and forth is just ridiculous. And then to make your own, well, that's a lot of custom work just to get a feature for a shotgun that you could just go get a Winchester 97 that you have a lot more of. We'll talk about that later. So ditch it. When it breaks, ditch it. We'll take it will quickly and cheaply turn it into that other model, the Riot, that we already like. And that's what happened. Now, that makes these exceedingly rare because 3,500 minus, well, most of them getting converted down to Riot guns. So, keep your eyes peeled, gentlemen. Now, if you think that's rare, let me tell you about the Unobtainium because this is not the only Remington trench gun. As a matter of fact, there's several more, but they were all prototypes and trials guns. Here we can see they tried a simple riot gun with a Remington rolling block bayonet that had a muzzle ring large enough to fit around the bore. They would also try for a long barreled model so you could bring down a bird and catch it on your skewer. This third one is set up as a trench model with the bayonet offset to the left. It's kind of likely again for the 1917 bayonet but I can't be sure from this one reference photo. The same general layout was trialed with the Mosin Nagant 1891 bayonet mount. Remember, Remington was also making those for the Russians. And finally, my favorite, a full-length, full-stock shotgun with 1891 bayonet. I really need to beg Mark to make one of these. All right, I was pretty happy to find those things, and if you think they're cool, you haven't seen what else I found. I cannot wait to share it. I just gotta get some stuff into... Trust me. Anyway, uh, let's recap. So trench gun's good, and we're going to talk about the Winchester 97, which was really the U.S. trench gun another time. This is the obscure little brother, and it didn't see a lot of wide use, and there were problems with the handguard, and I really don't have field reports on the Model 10 in particular, although I really, really suspect that this would do better for mud. As a matter of fact, uh, if Ian and Carl need any help, I'm sure we can get a commercial 10 and a commercial 97 to them so that they can do a comparison. That's their bag. Anyway, I like the 10. I think it did well enough. I'm sure it was in such small numbers that it didn't see as much service as the 97. That's just the way it is. But, uh, commercially, this gun would last until 1928 in terms of production. It would be sold for a few more years concurrently with its replacement model, the 29. And honestly, that gun is just an improved version by Mr. Loomis, although well beyond our scope today. Instead, let's go ahead and remind you that if there's anything you feel like is missing from this episode in terms of sort of extra ferial shotgun data, don't forget this is going to be episode one of three, and no, they aren't coming up next. I'm going to spread those suckers around. You can't just put all the shotguns in one bucket. Anyway, right now, let's go get May's opinion on the Model 10. Listen up, you primitive poop heads. This is May, and this is my boomstick. So, let's get her opinion on using the Remington Model 10 trench gun. Here you go. Thank you. And take us through the ergonomics, please. All right, guys, so this is our very first shotgun, so I'm super excited. Um, just for simplicity's sake, though, and for comparing later on, I am just gonna kind of talk like this as if it's like a rifle, just to kind of get through the descriptions and everything. So here we go. First things first, this guy, he's got a good bit of weight to him, but he balances well. Like, I mean, he still feels comfortable in my grip. Now, granted, thinking about balance, as you load cartridges in here, it is going to get heavier and want to nose down a little bit more, depending on how many you got in there. But, you know, it's still not bad. It's still nice. Now, that being said about the weight, I mean, you can see this guy is actually fairly long. And when you add the bayonet to it, Oh my goodness, does it grow? If I can get that on there, yes! Ha! <laughs> Look how terrifying that is, but insanely long too. I mean, seriously guys, this is not a short gun. Like, our Carcano is basically, like the carbine came like right up to here, but you're trying to add like a bayonet lug onto the end of it, which I'm sure that's the reason why I extended the link. Plus they've got this long magazine tube, I mean, there's just a lot of weight and length to this guy. That being said, it is still balanced enough that I didn't really feel like I was having a lot of trouble bringing the sight back down with every shot. Um, now I absolutely love the fact that it's got this semi-pistol grip, and plus it's a thin wrist, so 
me with my tiny little hands, not super tiny, but tiny enough, you know what I mean, tinier than Othias hands, are able to get a full grip on this guy. Like I'm able to get a nice good purchase and pull it back into my shoulder, which I thoroughly appreciate. And the comb is high, so my cheek weld is right along that site. It is perfect, I love that. An operation of the is not difficult. That button is easy enough to press and loading the first round. And as you saw in the video with me shooting, I really didn't have any trouble keeping this guy on my shoulder while operating the action. It was nice. Now I will say, there is one weird thing about this guy. Well, one more second before I get into that. Safety, ambidextrous safety, so anyone can operate that. But onto the weird last little bit. There's a handguard on the barrel, like, eh. As a shotgun, that's a little bit weird to me because me handling shotguns before in the past, which I used to do a little bit of shooting back in the day, it's just, that's just not where I'm going to grip it. I'm going to want to grip it underneath. Or, I just don't really see why this is necessary. So ergonomics wise, this thing is cool. It's badass looking, but what's with that handguard? That's a little weird. Yeah, I can understand, man. I can understand you what they may. were going for. And certainly the metal ones that we'll see on another model later make a little bit more sense. Uh, but it is a little odd. You get so used to shotgun handling, um, especially down here in the dirty south. You just know to grab it by the forestock and you always keep your little sensitive fingertips away from that barrel after it's been warming up. Yeah. Uh, but more whatever, hike, run, and slap. Also heat mirage, who knows? Although, heat mirage with a shotgun. Um, it's here. Now, uh, you may have noticed that this has changed ever so slightly over the course of the episode, and that's because it took us two attempts at the range to really get this rocking and rolling. We tested the first configuration out with birdshot. That worked fine. And then when we went to film, uh, Double Odd Buck managed to kick this thing right off the gun, repeatedly. Like every shot, just would poop it forward just a little bit further. What we learned, uh, with a little help from our friend Danny over at Cody, and with uh, some analysis of the gun that we have, which was an original trench gun, uh, we found that it's actually inleted underneath this uh, magazine tube set piece, so we actually had to run a spring up under there. So there's a piece of metal that extends beyond the handguard, which we now properly have installed, which is why we were able to properly film the episode. And we went a little bit rugged on the fittings just to kind of get it where it would function for the show. Even with this setup, I see this potentially developing a lot of problems. The rivets are right at the edge of the gun. Uh, they're going to crack. As a matter of fact, ours are cracked. We had to constantly rebed them, essentially. Um, Mark did some magic with some acrid glass to make sure that this held together over the long run. Um, not a solid military design, and it's obvious why so many of them lost their handguards and there was no real effort to restore the handguard, and instead they just converted them to a different pattern. Now, uh, oh, with all that sort of covered, let's talk about actually shooting this, and I mean at the targets because we have two different types of shooting to talk about so just if you're mano a mano with a piece of paper that's charging you from the enemy trench or is holding a trench that you want how did this thing do in that regard first things first lining up the sights this bead if you guys can't see it it is massive so you know even for just like shotgun sights this is like pretty decent read in my opinion um the trigger it's a single stage Oh my goodness, this was fantastic. Like, I did not know when the break was coming. It was so clean. It was, I loved, love, love, love this trigger. I cannot say that enough. So this was a pleasant, pleasant surprise. Um, and then the recoil. So when we were first shooting up with Ice, I already mentioned, we were just shooting birdshot just for the heck of it. And we were just having so much fun with that. Like the recoil was like so simple, so light. Like it was nice. And then we put some double out buckshot, buckshot in there. Oh my goodness, I forgot what that was for a second. Now me being a recoil queen, which if you guys haven't seen the Tiga Bear video, I'll go watch that and that clearly says it all. But I actually liked the heavier recoil. I can see how someone else who is used to more like birdshot would not care for it. But on this guy, I felt like it was still manageable. It does rock you more obviously, but it's you're still able to get your sights realigned fairly quickly in my opinion. And when shooting, we were shooting two different ranges. We shot one at 50 yards for target and then one at 50 feet. The 50 yards, I mean, I still got it on target. It was still lethal, but you know, I'd want to take an extra shot just to be on the safe side that I actually, you know, definitely got that paper target. Whereas 50 feet, oh yeah, first shot, phew, that, that paper target didn't stand a chance. So for shooting, 
This guy was awesome. It was pleasant. I wish I had more than five rounds, but I can only imagine the weight that would come with that. But yeah, that was, this was an awesome shoot. Yeah, I think the uh, pattern on his target spoke for themselves. And by the way, a lot of that circle was done in the first shot and then it just piled up from there. Look, I understand that video games have this logic that these things shoot like a four foot wide spray at whatever. Um, and then a lot of people argue that, oh, well, since it doesn't do that, it must be almost like a rifle. Well, no, it's not that either. The shotgun has its range. It's an ideal range. It's a cone. We could talk about it all day. We're not going to. There's, there's lots of videos on defensive shotgun or offensive shotgun use. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's something nice about the idea that you can unload what would be an entire magazine plus one or two rounds of 32 ACP in one go at close range with something like this. I mean, think about it. We got countries struggling for ruby pistols and things like that so that they have something that they can pop, 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 pop as fast as they can. Imagine just pop and the whole magazine is out and it's in the other guy. Oh my God, that sounds terrifying, but that's what it is. Yeah, it's fantastic in terms of offensive strategy and uh, pretty good if you got somebody immediately over your trench wall coming in. So I can see why the Germans complained. Now, uh, there was another type of shooting that we did try. This is coming from a bit of a rumor. Now, we went ahead and tried this with the Remington Mall 10 because we uh, definitely want to talk about the Winchester 97, but this gun, uh, by the way, slam fire, we talked about this earlier in the episode, this gun should be able to theoretically slam fire, however the sear has become worn over 100 years of use. Um, so what we will do is we'll make sure that we have a Winchester 97 that can slam fire so we can demonstrate that for you. And we'll talk about slam fire in that episode, and we took this myth to talk about in this episode to sort of have one for each. So... This gun, we went ahead and tested the myth of whether or not you could deflect enemy grenades. Now the tricky part about this is that you cannot use birdshot that has a better dispersal, although lighter load. Um, we didn't even bother trying what birdshot would do no, to grenades. Because I didn't have a lot of faith in birdshot puncturing them anyway. Um, instead you got to hit with buck in midair. Now, I know you guys saw something that looked kind of impressive, but I have my doubts about this. But let's let May talk about her experience with it first. So guys, I have shot skeet before, so I've, I've shot things out of the air with birdshot, and that wasn't that hard. But shooting things out of the air with double out buck? Not that easy. I mean, think about the target. I've got this loping grenade being thrown at me or in my general direction. I'm trying to aim for the head to try to, you know, detonate it. It was definitely not easy. Like, I managed to hit the stock just fine, or just made, barely managed to ding the head. I would say, out of all of my shots, only two of them really put you know, deep solid holes in those grenades that I thought would have considered like them to be, you know, dead. But other than that, I feel like all I did was manage to stop these grenades in their tracks. Not once did I manage to send it flying back to the other trench. So, I mean, great, I stopped it, but I didn't necessarily kill it every time and I definitely didn't send it back. So that myth is kind of a little bit broken there, but at least I did stop it every time I had plugged it. Now, all of this being said, I will say that I was at the ready. Like, I was prepared for this to be thrown at me. I honestly can't see myself not being at the ready, suddenly seeing grenade being thrown, just being able to get my rifle ready and up in time in order to actually plug it. Like, I can't see the timing on that just being, I can't see myself being that quick at all. So, I'm, I really only think that in real life this maybe potentially might have happened, like maybe once or twice, maybe, maybe, maybe. But, you know, it, it just seems like it's, that's a weird myth that's been cultivated by it. Kind of neat, but again, just don't think it's that possible. Yeah, being on range with all that, the uh, effects are pretty cool. Uh, we filled these with baby powder and they're still leaking. Um, lots of stock damage, that's for sure. The stocks got hit plenty. We had to tape them up to keep kind of putting them into the field so that we could actually get metal hits. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got some nice ringers in here. Uh, yeah, you can see some solid dents and holes in the top. So. Yeah, and, and by the way, guys, I'm not a grenade expert, so you would have to sort of debate what kind of pressure you can get on this thing once it's been breached on the outside at all. I imagine these are still somewhat dangerous, even if you've breached the exterior, unless you've destroyed, you know, some of the internal mechanism. Uh, I'm sure you'll have all sorts of comments uh, about that. Well, there's going to be no second take on this one because now we're just covered in chalk and baby powder. All right, so, um, a grenade myth aside, uh, which, by the way, apparently plausible, but probably not doctrine. Um, grenade myth aside, uh, what do you think about carrying one of these into the trenches? 
Oh, heck yeah. Are you kidding me? Yes, this was going to get a solid yes. I mean, think about it. Close quarters, this guy is a badass. And I am so accurate with this guy. I mean, yeah, if I get out to like 50 yards, then we're going to, I don't want to get more than one hit out on the guy. But you know what? I'm not thinking like long distance with this one. I'm thinking I'm storming a trench with this or a trench is being stormed and I got to be defending it. Like, that's what I'm thinking this guy is for. And he performed excellently so yeah i would definitely take this one into battle all right that's a resounding yes Is however it? however i know some of you are still thinking one more thing and i saved it for last because it's probably driving you crazy you probably already typed it in the comments which is why didn't we load one and then load five why did we not plus one our shotgun so that we could go eight bananas right very easy to do on the 97, we'll talk about that another time. However, particular to this mechanism, let me tell you, we tried single loading the shotgun and that is the worst jam-o-matic nightmare you have ever seen. Never try to single load straight to the chamber a Remington Model 10 because the ejection system just hates it. Oh my God, we've never had more trouble with that. Jay was so sad. <laughs> All right, anyway, that's gonna wrap us up. So uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope this was exciting and uh, we'll see you later. Bye, guys. All right, guys, we are gearing up for the return of t-shirts in the next few days. I'm thinking USA and Austria-Hungary this time. Why not? Additionally, I should probably say we've now had two big offers to dig into some World War I machine gun collections this year. I'm hoping that the first of these episodes will appear sometime in December. The footage you're seeing now was actually filmed back at the Lewis, but sadly our plans for an 08 fell through and it's just been sitting around gathering dust. We get a lot of comments on why we haven't done many MGs, and frankly, they are brutally expensive in terms of both time and money, as they require travel, scripting well ahead of time, trial and error in the field, and a a ammo. Plus, we had to get big enough that people would know we were around to loan them to us. It's not like they're everywhere. So I want to thank everyone for our continued growth, because with every day, it seems like the hardest things that we have ahead of us become just a little bit easier with your help. Hey, Jay. Yeah. I know you're dip man, but it looks like you've been smoking over here. <laughs>